The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. I'm Kristen Stowes. Please join me for my conversation with Judy Cook, 2013 State Genealogist of the Year. Hello, I'm your host on Live and Learn, Tim Francis. My guest today will be Dr. Ann Bleed. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and today we're going to be racing Corvettes with 91-year-old Bobby Smith of Arnold, Nebraska, and Bruce Younglove of Lincoln, Nebraska. They go really fast. Stay tuned. My guest is Anthony Massinio, who's vice president of Valentino's, and we're going to be talking about the Valentino's history. I'm Sam Truex, and today on Live and Learn, we will learn the benefits of volunteering from my guest, Alan Beans of the Bryan Medical Center. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Do you know where you came from? I'm Kristen Stowes, and no, I'm not talking the birds and the bees, but genealogy, as I welcome the Education Chair of the Lincoln-Lancaster County Genealogical Society, Judy Cook. Hi, Judy, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. <laughs> Absolutely, wonderful to have you here. You were recently named the 2014 State Genealogi Genealogist of the Year, as well as receiving the Distinguished Service Award from the Federation of Genealogical Societies. Congratulations, that must have been a thrill. It, it really was, and a surprise, but <laughs> I do perceive it as an award for our genealogical society rather than just a personal one. Sure, sure, understand. How and when did you first become interested in genealogy? Well, I think it goes back to the fact that I never knew my grandparents. I, I knew one grandfather um, that I saw for a short time before he died, but I mm -hmm. was yearning for those stories. Oh. And when I was married, I, I met uh, a grandmother who was filled with those stories, and that's where I started thinking, oh, that's I would beautiful. like to... I would like to learn more. Sure, sure. So how far back have you traced your own roots? With the help of other people I've on my maternal side, I've gone back to the 16th century or the 1500s in Europe. However, on my paternal side, I'm stuck in the um, 1800s. <laughs> uh, the term we often use is a brick wall. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure you're looking forward to the day when you can break through the brick wall, Absolutely. right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I have to say, when I think of tackling this project for my own family, I'm overwhelmed by the idea of it. Where is a good place to start? The first thing, the general guideline, is to gather everything that you've got. Bring it together. If you've got pictures in shoeboxes or wherever, bring them all together. Uh, if you've got mementos, memorabilia, bring it all into one place and then start thinking about all the people that you can ask questions. The people that you could do a digital recording of their stories, mm. uh, older relatives, sometimes neighbors. It, the first thing is a gathering of everything and bringing it together. Okay, okay. Um, I'm thinking we probably have more at home than we really realize if we have old family Bibles in absolutely, our possession. Absolutely, absolutely. Things like that. Bibles, uh, other records, uh, photos of, uh, or maybe war uh, memorials. Oh, uh, yes, okay. Different things. Okay. So how do you like to organize your information as you collect it? Because it's so important to keep this organized, I'm right. sure. Uh, right, and organization isn't one of my strengths, but something that worked for me was to begin with um, the uh, protective sheets uh, that one can get that are acid-free, and then uh, using a three-ring binder, these sheets have three ring holes in them, putting uh, together all the stories and all the information you have about someone, and also slip in these protective sheets some of the photos. Then if you make a notebook, for instance, for your mother before she was married, your mm -hmm. father before she was married, and then another one, for, you do them in chronological order. It's a way to get memorabilia, photos, census records, mm -hmm. letters, everything oh. together. Right, right. Then, okay. <laughs> you move from paper to electronic, ah. Yeah, and you get it, you scan everything, mm -hmm. uh, scan your photos, scan your documents. Uh, you can also include your digital stories uh, oh. in computer programs, and you get it in a fashion electronically mm -hmm. where you can save it, preserve it, and share it mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That sounds like a plan. <laughs> you just have to have a plan. Right. So once the information you have at home has been researched and cataloged, there are many free resources available out in the community. Is this true? This is very true. Okay. Uh, you can start with your local libraries here in Lincoln. There are many things we can do. Uh, databases that you can use at home uh, to check census records as long as you have a library card. Or uh, you can go through the Library Commission and do it. Mm -hmm. But don't overlook museums, uh, historical societies, old newspapers. Oh. There are many places where you can get free information. Uh, but also, again, remember, talk to people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And perhaps a trip home to your... Absolutely. Yes. Go to the site, get yes. a sense of what it will look like, take photos before it changes mm -hmm. drastically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, here in Lincoln, I know we are very fortunate to have many fabulous places to actually do family research. And right. I believe we will be showing on the screen a list of some places here in Lincoln where our right. viewers could go. Right. And would you like to talk about these a little bit? Right. Uh, on our uh, Lincoln Lancaster County Genealogical Society website, we have a place called local resources and one of our volunteers has listed things that we have that we can go to here in Lincoln. For example, uh, the Family History Center. The Mormons have traditionally been uh, advocates of finding out about your family history and saving the information. So it's a place where you can go and do some searching. Uh, there are local societies, uh, there are the, the libraries, the State Historical Society. Um, we. <laughs> We're very blessed here in Lincoln in that we have the Germans from Russia site, oh, which is internationally yes. known. Really? And just down the road in Wymore, another internationally known Welsh center with people who can translate Welsh, if you oh. have that. There are Scandinavian sites not far from here uh, where we can get information. And also, uh, don't overlook uh, Beatrice and the Homestead Monument. If there's anyone who has uh, any homesteads in Nebraska, you can get excellent information from that. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, Judy. Wow. Right. That would take a lot, lot of time to research all those places, right, but it's right. wonderful that they are there. Yeah, and we also have vital records if you want to get birth certificates. Uh, you can go to the city county building to get information. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so it, My goodness. we are promoting Lincoln as sort of a, a destination site for genealogy research really? so that we can have more conferences here and attract people to come to Lincoln because of the sure. unique collections. Oh, what a good idea. That's fabulous. There is a wonderful online resource that you told me about that can be very helpful, and this is actually created by the volunteers of the yes. Lincoln Lancaster County Genealogical Society. Right. Right. Could you please tell us what all we could find on that site? Well, it's, it's one that is accessible to people all over the world, and I think that's one of the reasons for the award. Um, we have volunteers who have uh, created the site and maintained it. Uh, you can search a database to try to find information about Lancaster County records. Um, you can find out about upcoming events. Uh, we use it to communicate with each other. Um, and we have about 300 members in the society. Really? But we also have um, a surname research on there. So someone, well, in fact, someone in Germany did this where he saw a name that was his surname or family name, uh -huh. and contacted us, and we had information uh, for really? him here in Lincoln. <laughs> and so he wondered what happened to the family after they migrated to um, yes. the United States. Yes, yes. That's fabulous. I bet he was thrilled. <laughs> he was. And so were we to have the contact with him. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, I know if you go on Google and you put in genealogy, you come up with a plethora of websites. Yes. Now, some of them require payment. Are these good and trustworthy sites to use? They are. Okay. Uh, I, uh, there are a number of them that uh, I really worth the membership. I, I think of it this way. Uh, for instance, one of the most popular one that you see promoted on, on television a lot, Ancestry.com, costs less than a dollar a day. Okay. And if you think about what it would cost to travel to a site to oh, find information certainly. or to find an old, mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, there are, but they, they can be trusted if you use discernment. If you notice, for instance, that someone was, was born before her parents were, <laughs> it probably is an accuracy <laughs> <Yes>. in that. <laughs> and uh, it's like any other thing, uh, be a wise consumer. Uh -huh. 
but it is a very, very helpful Okay, all right, that's resource. good to know. Of course, what would a project be without stumbling blocks? And we talked about a, a couple that I think is, they're very worthwhile in mentioning. You told me that it is more difficult to research maternal ancestors. Why would that be? Absolutely. Uh, you, you cannot find out about their heritage unless you know their maiden name. Mm -hmm. And um, an example in my own family where I told you I was stuck in the 1800s, my great-grandmother's name was Henrietta. <laughs> I don't know her last name. Okay. I know her married name. Uh, I know she was from Hanover. Okay. Uh, this is, is a difficult thing uh, in terms of researching women, and so many times in terms of property ownership or um, information, it was done with a, the male Certainly. head of household. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. it is more difficult to find yes. women. And how about if the spelling of an ancestor's name changes as you do this research? Is oh. that a red flag? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, it's Can just be. one of the challenges okay. along All the right. way. They change frequently. Uh, and you need to be someone who looks outside the box okay. and think, oh, I wonder if they spelled it this way. Or I wonder if it sounded like this, so they started it with a different letter. Okay. Um, it, Spelling <laughs> is a challenge. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, those are two things we don't want people to get hung up on. <laughs> what creative things can you do with genealogy? There are many things that you can do, but I, I'd like to start with some things that one of our members, Phyllis Erickson, has done. Um, it's, it's the idea of start small. So, for instance, the one <clears throat> that you see on the screen, the ancestry of an individual, uh, that is a booklet she put together about one person where okay. she focused on what information she had. Uh -huh. You can move then to larger books where you can put your family tree. This comes from a book that has at least 200 pages in it and represents about 30 years of her really? research. But oh. she's put it together in an attractive format uh, and then included stories. Mm. Um, you, you see how effective it is to have pictures and stories? Absolutely. Instead of just a line where you are number 65 and you yes. turn back and you see names and dates, it, it gives a human element to it. And such a treasure to be able to pass that down. Right, and here she's included a photo of the site where they live, the original okay. church, uh -huh. and then original records. Uh -huh. So it's a way to bring together some very fragile things, take a photo of them and Mm -hmm. put it in something that someone can see and mm -hmm. it has it has meaning. Oh, that's just wonderful. Then I believe we have two more pictures that were actually taken from a wall hanging. Right. And that that is just a beautiful piece. Can you talk about that a little bit? It is. Um, I've seen uh, many things that people have done in our local society and the state and national genealogical forums that I've gone to. But uh, this is where she used her creative skills and a program that's available um, to uh, make, if we can back up please, to the wall hanging. <laughs> uh, the, um, what she's done on the back of it is taken a photo where her ancestors actually lived. She was able to oh, visit I the country see. where they lived, take an actual photo of the site of what we would call oh. our ancestral home, and then over it she superimposed her husband and her, and then uh, another generation, and another generation, and another that's, generation. That's so subtle, but just right. makes it beautiful. But it shows it shows hundreds of years of information in uh -huh. an attractive uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. I believe we have the information to put on screen how people can uh, find local classes that actually teach yes. the basics of genealogy yes. and research. And again, we're very fortunate in the Lincoln area. We have. Um, members of our society who are teaching classes at Southeast Community College. Okay. There are members who are te teaching OLLI classes oh, on genealogy sure, and giving sure. hands-on ex experiences with the computer. Um, we have with our uh, society every Sunday afternoon at Walt Library uh -huh. two hours of uh, a time where there will be a class, a time to bring your questions, or maybe a focus on an interest group, like if you have a German heritage, there's a German interest group. Okay. If you have a Czech heritage, uh -huh. and so uh -huh. on. Sure. Um, there's a group that gets together called the Get Her Done Group. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And, <laughs> right, well, and it would fit for what you've said, where you have things at home and you're wondering about 
mm -hmm. what to do, sure. it encourages you to get it done. Well, Judy, we have time just for a real quick response, but besides the interest factor of genealogy, why do you feel it's so important? Personally, I, I feel it's part of who I am. It helps me understand myself. It helps me realize why I have some of the traits that I do. Mm -hmm. But I also saw a quote from Gil Savory in the Journal Star where he said, you know when you're driving, it's awfully good to have a rear view mirror. <laughs> yeah, I like that, I <laughs> like that. I, I thought that was a good one. And then there's one other thing, and I, I see it in um, a poem by Marjorie Sizer in Bones of a Very Fine Hand, and it's called Asking. Oh. I've heard so many people say, oh, I wish I would have asked those questions. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a very good point to end on. Thank you, Judy, for being with us today. Thank you. I, I think you've given us all the nudge to take on this project well, ourselves. I, you could spend a whole session <laughs> and learn on one phase of That's this. right. Well, and I'd like to say to our viewers, remember, while you are researching your own family tree, it's never too late to live and learn. Hello, I'm your host today on Live and Learn, Tim Francis. My guest today is Ann Bleed, Dr. Ann Bleed, a longtime local activist, environmentalist, volunteer. That's about right. Um, a contributor to the quality of life in Lincoln, Lancaster County, Nebraska. And thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. You've held a number of elected positions over the years in public office. Well, actually, I only have one elected position. So everything else is volunteer or appointed? Right. Talk about your current position, which you're currently involved in. I'm currently in. Uh, on the uh, Lower Platte South NRD board, which is an elected position. Natural Resource District. It's a natural res. thank you. That's a natural resources district, uh, which includes all of Lincoln and a lot of areas outside of Lincoln. Uh, it's very important for the health of Lincoln. Um, it was very active, for example, in making sure that the town was not flooded in some of the late recent rains. We had rains on Oak Creek, and the NRD dams um, protected them to the point of $1.15 million just in the early rain in the early part of this summer. Well, the resource district, they go back 40 years, 50 years? They were uh, established in 1972. Oh, really? Yes. That recently? It was fairly recent. Um, they were an amalgam of a number of special resource districts. Uh, there were over 500 them, of them across the state, and it got to be what Clayton Yider called districtitis. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they followed uh, topographic. They follow uh, watershed boundaries, yes, surface yes. watershed boundaries. Not governmental subdivisions. They, well, they fitted the governmental subject divisions somewhat to the boundaries, mm -hmm. but not completely, so that some NRDs involve a number of different counties and vice versa. And in the, in the, in the last few years, NRDs participate with a trail system, do they not? They have a wide range of uh, responsibilities, including recreation and trails, but also groundwater is a big mm -hmm. issue for the NRDs, uh, soil and water conservation, uh, habitat, and flood um, plain, um, or flooding, or protecting against floods, I should flood say, control. water quality. And as a result of some of this, we've got recreational lakes. We have recreational lakes um, all around the district. Uh, a big project that the NRD worked with the city and the university on was the Antelope Creek um, waterway, the whole, the whole redevelopment of Antelope Creek. Um, they often cooperate with cities and towns and the county to uh, increase the uh, services we get from our water mm -hmm. resources, mm -hmm. or our natural resources. Well, you've been in Lincoln almost 40 years. You came here for a career. Well, actually, I came here with my husband. So, so you were taken captive and brought to Nebraska. <laughs> Somewhat. And how did you get involved in community organizing as a, as a young married person? Well, was I was young. I had two children. I was a stay-at-home mom. And as most stay-at-home moms will tell you, they don't want to think only about babies and diapers, so I joined the League of Women Voters and became very involved with the League and then their environmental community eventually was president of the League. And that really got me started in um, 
uh, into volunteering and being aware of the uh, politics and the public policies and so forth of Lincoln. Well, and you served a few years on the planning commission. Right, I was on the planning commission almost 12 years, and that was a very uh, informative and interesting experience. And that dealt with a lot of development and construction and At that point in time, use. there was a lot of development going on, and so we did deal with neighborhood issues, land use issues, uh, flood issues. We dealt with floodplain zoning, for example, and certainly development of some of the major shopping areas and so forth. Well, your civic activities seem to kind of parallel your career. Yes, they do. Work. Tell us a little bit about those overlapping interests. In well, I've always had an interest in um, the ecosystem because uh, we depend on the ecosystem for our very livelihoods. That they often talk about ecosystem services. Uh, our clean water is a uh, result of ecosystem services, if you will. The fact that it goes through the groundwater and through wetlands, um, which help remove contaminants. Those kinds of services are very important. And so I've always wanted to make sure we sustain those for not only our lives, but our children's lives. So I got involved with the environmental group in the um, League of Women Voters, and that led to an interest in an um, engineering degree. Uh, I already had a PhD in ecology, um, and my career, in essence. Well, that had, to have been kind of, you would have been an early person in that field of study, oh, yeah. I would think. <laughs> yes. And probably didn't attract a lot of women to that field no, of study. it surely <laughs> didn't. I was often the only woman uh, in a class or the only woman at a meeting. Um, and now I'm delighted to say that's no longer true. There are a lot of women in the field, and I'm very excited about that. But were there a, a few barriers early on in your career? Or? I think there still are barriers. Um, but yeah, there were uh, people who just didn't think that women could, could be engineers. Um, but even today, there's still issues. Um, one of my biggest struggles when I don't get an idea across, for example, is did I not get that idea across because I didn't say it well, or were they not listening because they were discounting me as a woman? And right. I think that still happens. Well, I'm, I'm kind of sure it does. I, I, there's plenty of evidence along those lines. Um, and you're still teaching, am I right? Yeah, I have a... Uh, I'm an adjunct professor. I have a part-time teaching position. I teach um, environmental policy and water law along with Anthony Schutz at the law school. Uh, that sounds like kind of a full schedule for somebody who's allegedly retired. Well, I, I'm not retired from life. I'm no Thanks. longer earning money. <laughs> <laughs> so or not much money, I should say. Have you seen a shift in public attitude towards the environment in the last 25 or 30, or awareness, or? Oh, I think there have been shifts. Uh, the 70s, of course, were uh, a period of very high awareness. That's when we pa passed the Environmental Policy Act and the Endangered Species Act. But in the water area, which has been a focus for my, of mine for many years, uh, when I first started getting involved in the water area, people assumed surface water and groundwater were not connected. And there was a big fight that when people suggested it was. Now I think most people accept the fact that they are connected. It's not groundwater and or surface water. It's a water resource. Water is water. Water is water, and, and there it, is a connection. And it just doesn't come out of the tap magically. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Do you um, see trends or concerns among the population that need to be called to attention or... Um, or indifference or um Well, I, th I think one thing that really concerns me is the um, number of people who don't vote, which is not only a right, but a major responsibility. And our democracy really depends on the watchfulness of the citizen, as it says on our state capitol. It's kind of frightening to think that a very small portion of the population gets to make the decisions while others... Yeah, if, if you don't vote, in my view, you have no right to complain. Oh, but that's the fun part, is complaining, <laughs> standing on the sidelines and watching. Um, what advice would you have, what counsel would you have for younger people who are interested in, the, in politics, interested in civic activities and as they're working and raising their kids? And, and 
how, what, what counsel would you have for them or what observations? Well, first of all, I have a lot of sympathy for younger people, especially young family members, because they uh, have a lot going on and uh, usually both people are working, which makes it very difficult. But I would say that it really does pay off to become involved in some kind of volunteer group, civic group, something that you're interested in to begin with. Um, and it really doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's something you're interested in and is contributing to the community. You get to know a lot of people you wouldn't know otherwise. You feel good about contributing uh, to the community, and it makes the community better. Well, I, I would imagine you learn a great deal. Oh, yes. From like-minded people. Well, uh, the fun thing about it is you also learn from unlike-minded <laughs> people, and I think that's extremely important. That's helpful, isn't it? Uh, because we tend to be on our own little silos on what we think, mm -hmm. and when you're challenged by some, an alternative point of view, you expand your thinking. That's very broad. Well, that's very empowering, isn't it? Oh, it's extremely empowering, and I think you end up with a better decision in the end, no matter what that decision is. Um, we're out of time, and I thank you. Well, thank you very much for having for, me, Tim. For being our guest. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. The Sand Hills Open Road Challenge is held every August in Arnold, Nebraska, a village of under 500 people which hosts racers from all over the country. 70-year-old Bruce Young Love of Lincoln is going 140 miles an hour. He's driving his red 208 Corvette uh, over a 55-mile course. He will average 110 miles per hour. And he never gets a speeding ticket. And that really ticks me off, you guys. <laughs> now, we've got two racers who are who come in from Arnold, Nebraska. This is Bobby Smith. Bobby is 91 years of age. Correct. Bruce yeah. is from Lincoln. Bruce is 71. And yeah. what do they do? Close, close down Arnold? Close the road? How, how do you get this race going every year? Bruce well, helped they, do that. Mm -hmm. They close down a 29-mile section of a county road between Arnold and Dunning. Nebraska, which is up in the sand hills, and, uh, it's, uh, and then we race the 29 miles up, and then we uh, have breakfast at the high school in Dunning, it's and then and every, we regrid and race back. Well, what is the 55 mile? I mean, I it's, thought it was 55 it's miles. It's 29 away. miles up and 26 back. Oh, so you have so to turn around. We have to turn around, regrid, and then uh, all race back. All right, we, don't, we don't race fender to fender. We race in different uh, categories, and mm -hmm. I race, for instance, in the 105 uh, or 110 category. And the objective is to average exactly 110. And that's so you, you set the, the rate that you're going to be averaging before right. you go. So those are the categories. So you say you're going to go how fast? 110. <laughs> average 110 and with a maximum allowable speed of 140. And, and you have to have a, a certain safety requirements in your car to be able to go that fast, mm -hmm. like a five-point hitch. Mm -hmm. uh, helmets, a fire suit, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now you can you can go as slow as 80 miles an hour, and it goes every five miles an hour, and then your maximum allowable speed goes up accordingly. Okay, um, why don't you describe the course? The course is uh, 29 miles up, and it's got 59 turns. <gasps> it's a small county road; it's only 22 feet wide with no shoulders. But it's concrete, isn't it? It's it's or asphalt. Cement. Asphalt, yeah. Asphalt. It's a, it's a very challenging road, but a, an awful lot of fun to drive. Mm -hmm. Well, explain the target speed. My target speed is what you want to average, and you could, it goes from 80 all the way up to uh, uh, 120. And uh, for instance, uh, if you wanted to average 100, and, uh, 100 miles an hour, your maximum allowable speed is, is uh, 120. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to average 90, then your maximal, uh, you can go 120, but you, you don't have to have all the safety equipment. Just You can bring a car from just for regular seat belts and uh, you don't even need a fire suit. Are women involved in this race? Oh yes, yeah we have, a, I would say probably two or three women drivers. Good for that, okay. And I've seen them collect some trophies. Now mostly car Corvettes or any other cars? I'd say they're mostly it. Corvettes because Corvette is so well suited for this but we have all cars. We have Mustangs, we even have a Lamborghini from California. Oh. Had two we, Lamborghinis in the last year. Wow. Yeah, and we've had Ferraris, we've had Mustangs, uh, Formula Ones. Uh, so an old-fashioned Chevy isn't competing with a Lamborghini no. because you have a different category, right? Right. 
Uh, it, you could have a Ferrari in the 90 class if it's his first race mm -hmm. against a pickup. Okay. And we've had pickup trucks in it, too. <laughs> <laughs> a pickup com compared to a Lamborghini is quite a contrast. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I blew my transmission out in, in one year, and I, I had my friend bring my pickup down. I raced my pickup in the 80 division. Well, the whole thing, what you're doing, blows my mind. <laughs> now, you've got to take a look at this, because we're going to take a look now at the shootout to give you a real good idea of what this is all about. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bruce Younglove, and I'm standing at the edge of Arnold, Nebraska, a small farming community of less than 500 people. And despite its laid-back appearance, there's something very unique about this town. And you know what's unique about it? This is what's unique about it. Bobby, this is crazy. <laughs> I can't believe that at age 91, you are still racing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that dangerous? No, not really, if you pay attention to what you do. Yeah, it's all right. It's fun. And anyway, you got to be careful. You, you got to know the course. You got to know your car. And you got to be lucky to win anything. And I think you've been probably pretty lucky. Yes, I have been pretty lucky, but I'm familiar with the territory because we pasture cattle on that same area in there. So, But you don't let those cows cross the road while during no. the race is on. You put a stop sign up for the cows? Uh, yes, we do, and, <laughs> and we, we have to teach the cows to read, too. <laughs> but anyway, there's two airplanes in the, in the air all the time during this race. Two airplanes. Two airplanes. Two airplanes to make sure that not deer crossing the road or turkeys getting in there and and uh, when this first started they didn't have very good radios but now we've got a radio system they can talk to one end of the course to the other all then it takes about uh, it takes about uh, I think about a hundred people on the court to uh, sit there and at every place every hill there's one guy with a flag and a yellow red flag and yellow flag he can see the guy on the next hill, and he can see the guy on the next hill. So if there's a wreck, immediately they can shut oh. that whole course down just that quick. Uh -huh. And then the radios get on it, and and there's always uh, I think I don't I think around uh, five or eight uh, somewhere around five between five and eight fire trucks immediately there. Mm -hmm. A year ago we had the uh, the. Uh, the helicopter out of North Platte said that they'd come over and they sat halfway on the course. We did have a wreck that year, and by the time they got him cut out of the car and so on, the helicopter's there and he is in Carney and within 30 minutes. Well, Bobby Smith, at age 91, I mean, usually for the rest of us, uh, aging is taking its course, and that means the hearing's going and the eyes are going and the, <laughs> the thinking sometimes is going. So. How, uh, what may do you eat good out out there in Arnold or yeah what about your eyesight and your hearing and all that kind of stuff uh, some of them say my hearing's gone <laughs> 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 and anyway I eat a lot of ice cream <laughs> I get up early and I spend 12 hours a day doing something all the time okay t tell me the safety measures you have to take when you're getting that car well, the most safe is that you got to be got to have your seat belt on, and you got to have it. Yeah, is it a seat belt or a harness? Well, it's a harness. Yeah, we got okay. a harness, but yeah. in the ninety mile an hour class, we don't have to have the qualification that Bruce was talking about. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have that, that helmet. But you see, in the ninety mile an hour class, from eighty up to a hundred, they start every thirty seconds apart. So that is where you can only go so fast and yeah. you can't go only to so slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, and where where he starts, they start them a minute apart. Oh so dear. to keep them apart. Right. And so <laughs> now you wear a helmet. I wear a helmet, yep, yep. And 
so on. You I wear everything I'm supposed to be. So <laughs> when they get me dressed, I'm all right and ready to go. <laughs> yeah, anything, a fire extinguisher, was that necessary? Yeah, they, yeah So you carry all that in the car and sure, in case something happens. Okay, this happens in Arnold every 14 years, you say? This will be our 15th, uh, the 15th year coming, year up, coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and in August, you, 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 anybody can participate, right? Yep. Anybody can participate. We'll give you the information as to who you can contact. Uh, uh, August the 8th, it'll be you know coming up this year. But now, Arnold, right. at under 500 people living mm -hmm. there, how do you accommodate all the racers that are coming in from all over the country? Volunteers. Volunteers. One for volunteers. We couldn't even start to make this well, thing where, happen. Where did the people the stay? The whole community. The community really gets together on this. You know, even in a town of 500, you have certain amount of people like to do this and some likes to do that. But in this race, everybody's together. It brings everybody well, in Arnold together. Where yet. do the racers stay? Well, that's in one, homes. That's one of the most unique things about this race is the townspeople open their homes to the racers. Isn't that incredible? And uh, my son and I, my son comes down from Minnesota. We race together and we stay at a, at a farm in Arnold and we have for the last nine years. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I would say all, all my friends that I race with stay with yeah. townspeople. In fact, some of the townspeople even move out of their house for the racers when, they, when they come to town. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're very accommodable yeah. and, and it's, a farm, it's farm friendly. Okay, uh, Bobby drove in from Arnold, Nebraska, which is about 220 20. miles from mm -hmm. Lincoln. He drove in in his Corvette, which he was driving. Tell us about the Corvette, Bobby. Well, the Corvette's a 2014 and it's, uh, it's a new technology in this car. It's called a Stingray, <coughs> C7 Stingray Corvette. And the technology is really, really different. I mean, the car sets down tighter. It doesn't spin out near as quick and everything. And, and in fact, uh, it drove so good that I won the 90 mile an hour class this year. <laughs> uh, my you matched your age, huh? Yeah, yeah. Dr you drove your age. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the correct time on my, my 90 mile an hour, if I did run it perfect, would be 36 minutes, 52 seconds, point zero zero zero. That's, I'd give you a ticket. And my time was 36 <laughs> minutes, 52 seconds, point zero nine eight. I 98 thousandths of a second from being perfect. So I won. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. I consider you perfect. He's got another car, too, a beautiful red Corvette. Now, how, how many Corvettes have you had? Well, I've actually had three, but the red one is a, was a convertible, and I, you know, we have dirt roads out there. I, I didn't care for this. <laughs> that, so I traded it off and got the 14. Yeah. Okay, recently, there was a big Corvette car show in Lincoln at, at the Gateway Bank out in East Lincoln, and cars came from all over. And of course, we focused on your car, Bruce, your Corvette. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a look at that now to get a really good inside look at what a Corvette really looks like, interior and exterior. Well, this is a 2008 uh, Corvette. It's got an LS3 engine and it comes stock with about 436 horsepower. Uh, I've, I've put some go-fast uh, additives on this car and I added about 80, 80 to 90 horse. So mm -hmm. it uh, comes out at about 500. 30 horsepower, and uh, it, uh, in order to uh, get in the higher brackets, you have to put in a harness bar, which, uh, which would What support. do you mean the higher brackets? Well, you mean the, the faster speeds? O over 105. Over average. 105 yeah. miles an hour. In order to get into that, you've got to have some extra safety equipment, uh -huh. and this has got a harness bar in it, the five-point belts, and, uh, and then you have to have a fire suit, a fire extinguisher. I was surprised sort of at all the people who showed up out there and all those magnificent cars. Yeah, this is uh, from the Nebraska Corvette Association annual all Corvette show. And we had over 200 of them from, I think from 19 states. And uh, so it was a very successful and, and raised a lot of money for our uh, charity, which is the Child Advocacy Center and the Food Bank. So we were real happy to do that. Now, what is this car worth? If I were to go out and buy that car. These cars are much cheaper than what people think. I think if somebody came up and offered me 35000 for it, you could drive it home. So th they're not as expensive as people think. The new, like the one he just bought, are pretty expensive. But uh, mine's a 2008, and uh, they keep their value relatively well, but uh, they're not, they don't cost as much as people think. That scene right there, it says, uh, my, that's my license plate, and that stands for SORC. Sand and, Hills Open Road Challenge. And number and two is number my, two. Who was, what was number Number two one? is my number, and they sold life numbers. This race has become the most popular open road race in America, and they only have about three of them around the country, Texas, Nevada, and Nebraska. And when this, this sells out in one day, and we have 120 racers, 
it's become that popular. Well, <laughs> one day. <laughs> well, if you're interested in in just watching or participating in the Sand Hills Open Race Challenge, you can do it the weekend of August the 8th of next year, 2015. And we do have a website that you can go to if you want like more information. And on the screen, you will see it. Um, there it is. It's www. SORCRace.com. SORCRace.com. Sandhills Open Road Race.com. And there's a, we're also looking for volunteers, so that'd be a good way to get involved uh, in the race, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Bobby, how delightful to meet you. Thank well, you for thank coming you. to Lincoln That's and been sharing a pleasure this with our folks. And Bruce, mm -hmm. what a pleasure for yeah. extending you know, the well, opportunity you. for me to participate in all this, too. It's a real pleasure being here. Thanks. <laughs> yes, and don't forget, it's never too late to live and learn how to race Corvettes. <laughs>
uh, pick up an order that you'd called in. Oh, yes. Yeah, good old days. Good old now, days. Now, how many locations do, do you have now? There's, uh, including franchises, 38 locations, mainly in Nebraska, a few in the other surrounding states. Okay. Uh, the, does that include the pizza to go, uh, yes. which are quite popular? Yep, really popular. You know, we, we still have some of our dining rooms here in town and in Omaha and, and around the state. But uh, the carry-out delivery units have become very, very popular for okay. us. Okay. Now, where the parking lot was, just east of uh, the Valentino's, the original mm -hmm. restaurant there, uh, you've developed that. And uh, well, what do we have there now? I was surprised about a couple of things. Sure. If you go over there now, the new, new building's up. We're on the same property where the, where the parking lot was. The big marquee was out there. And it's a three-story building. You know, Valentino's, we take up just part of the first floor there. We're on the north uh, northwest corner of that property. And, it, and uh, so we've got our dining room there, uh, carry-out delivery unit. Uh, there's some other retail that's going in on the first floor. And then the second floor, the university has a hotel there where they rent out rooms, to, I think, to people that are traveling or families or professors that are coming in town. And then the third floor is a single room apartments. Okay, the, the awesome. hotel was a part when I went to pull in there to park one day and it was marked hotel. And, yes. And, yeah. uh, oh, I didn't realize that, that we had a hotel. But I can understand the university using a, a place for visiting professors, people that they're thinking about hiring, that sort of thing. Okay, uh, now I filmed the activities. I filmed the last day of operation uh, uh, and of course, I, f I filmed the day before that when the college uh, graduation was, and mm -hmm. there was uh, always there was a big line after that, uh, Mother's Day, uh, and then I filmed uh, the auction. Uh, I know you mentioned uh, what date the auction was going to be, so uh, we're seeing some films of the uh, new location there now. Uh, that's the old. That's still the old location, right? Oh, that's there. the old location. Yep. Okay, yeah. And I think that's probably one All of the right. last days and there. That was one of the auction items. I yep. wanted that one. That's a. That's an auction. Yep, that was during the auction. And then I got an item that uh, I'm quite proud of. I've got a little bit of the history of Valentino's, and there's so, a party that, room. There okay. a lot of uh, that, banquets down there, and a lot of great stuff. Uh, oh yeah, a lot, lot of stores. memories. A lot yep, of memories absolutely. there. Absolutely. Okay. All right, now there's the picture that I purchased at the yep. auction. And uh, so uh, actually Tony's in there, Ron yep. is in there. Absolutely, there's uh, Ron's on the left and uh, Tony is handing the pizza over to the customer coming in there. Okay. And you can see the old sacks, how we used to sack those, uh, the pizzas for carryout. You know, before delivery became popular, we used to have our pizzas in the sacks to go. So that's kind of an old, old history there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know when that picture was taken, but uh, uh, I was dumbfounded that I was able to get that at the auction. I just kind of casually p took a number and uh, uh, I wanted to get some piece of the history, but uh, uh, so yeah, I ended up with uh, that. Uh, okay, now where the original site was, and that's what we're talking about today, mm -hmm. they started demolition on that and uh, I was there, I filmed uh, uh, some of the demolition, I stuck around for uh, most of the time for the first three days, and then uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get some of those pictures coming up here. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the demolition and uh, uh, maybe plans for that area. You know, the developer uh, visiting with them, they, they plan on another building pretty much similar to what's the uh, new building that's up there now. I know I think they're talking a mix of some retail uh, and housing. Not sure if they'll do another hotel part of that, but uh, same kind of a mixed use building, I believe three stories, so that should be, uh, that should be nice. There's the demolition there. That, uh, you know, that building, great old building, but uh, it spent a lot of years feeding a lot of people in Lincoln and uh, Harlan, you were right in the mix of it. Well, uh, yes, uh, I had a little argument with uh, the insurance representative, and so then from then on, why I was uh, uh, stayed back behind the fence. But uh, right. yeah, I had my hard hat on and the whole bit, but uh, that that didn't count. 
Well, uh, what, uh, what's in the future for Valentino's? I know you just opened not too long ago a new one in Omaha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've opened a few new to-go locations up in Omaha. You know, we're, we're always uh, looking for new places and, and new ideas, and our retail line is going really well. You know, our sauces are in the grocery stores, and, and we're just trying to make sure that we're still uh, managing the properties that we have now the right way. You know, we uh, busy time of year with Husker football and being down in the stadium and being part of the, the athletic program. Uh, we're proud to be a part of that. And then just maintain that high quality of pizza and pastas that you've uh, had for over 50, 70 All years. All right. Well, hey, Anthony, thank you for coming and being on the Live and Learn Show. Uh, I know I've had a lot of fun just being a part of this whole demolition and learning a little bit about uh, uh, the whole Valentino's process, looking up on the Internet uh, a little bit about your history. That was uh, interesting to me. And how many Valentino's places there are in California, Oregon, and all around the country that are not related to your operation. Right, right. But uh, uh, the name is out there. So uh, thanks for being on the show. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. I'm Sam Truax, and I've noticed that many people say, what will I do when I retire, or what will I do now that I have retired? And waiting to see what the grandkids are going to do is not a real active, healthy lifestyle, although I recently incapacitated myself playing basketball with the grandkids, so consequently, sometimes it's a little too active, but Nevertheless, as a person born in 1936, I understand the value of staying active and the benefits of volunteering. And so does my guest today, who is Alan Beans. She's the director of volunteers and customer care at the Bryan Medical Center, and she'll tell us about volunteering. Alan, after 33 years experience in this work, what is your general impression of volunteering in Lincoln? Sam? Um, Lincoln is a great community and they support volunteer, volunteering wholeheartedly. Um, it's one of the things that contributes to this being such a positive, positive community. Um, as a community we believe in pitching in and working together. However, even as the number of volunteers grow and the interest in volunteering grow, so do the needs. Um, at Bryan, we have lots of needs and we need lots of volunteers and so I appreciate being on the show today. Yeah, I understand you could use about a hundred more volunteers at Bryan and other, there's other organizations that have the same. But yep. with so many openings, how many volunteers actually work at Bryan, at the Booker Bryan campuses? We feel very blessed. Um, at Bryan we have approximately 650 volunteers. Um, they all come in about one time a week. Some are on call. We have approximately 40, no, approximately 70 volunteers age 14 through high school graduation. Approximately 150 volunteers that are in college. We have mm -hmm. many individuals that are in the workforce. They come to us in the evenings and weekends. And then we have um, retired individuals. Yes, I understand they can kind of uh, schedule themselves so that they can fit clear up to midnight if they happen to be working. And such. They sure and, can. And I, contend, I have contended on previous programs that the young people are activists, but the older people are the ones who actually get things done. How does that philosophy fit with your experience with the volunteers? We are always amazed at the types of projects and the hands-on that our volunteers um, offer us. Um, our retired individuals, um, our older volunteers, they just jump right in, get the job done, and move on to the next task. So. And um, we're just really amazed at the amount of work that can be accomplished by volunteers. So actually, 
the volunteers get it done, even if they are young activists. <laughs> Sounds to me like. They huh? do. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides the satisfaction of serving other people, the other advantages of volunteering are exposure to new experiences and staying active. Mm -hmm. So staying active is important for some, but not necessarily for everybody because... You know, I have had 33 years of experience um, at Bryan, and I have met hundreds, thousands of individuals who have come through our doors and joined us as volunteers. My observation and my belief is that volunteering does add to your life. It, it adds health emotionally, physically, mentally, um, you just feel better about giving of yourself. You meet all sorts of wonderful people in the path of volunteering, and you're part of a team. Our volunteers are part of the, the team at Bryan, and, and it's, a, it's a great partnership. Well, I understand that your mother is a volunteer, and so she kind of passed that interest on to you, apparently, but she's 95, and... She is. My mom, Ruth Holstein, had volunteered her entire life. Um, she was a great role. She is a great role model. Um, she is no longer able to at age 95, but she, she just quit volunteering at about age 92. Um, for our entire life, my mom and dad were, were really great mentors and showed us the way and showed us that giving of yourself is a, a great piece of living. Well, more important to the general public is that show that her volunteering actually kept her active and probably more healthy than she would have otherwise been. I, I truly believe that, and I have many other examples that I work with on a daily basis. People that come to us and they're just all smiles, all positive. They, they think positive and they think about helping others and and well, it's just a really cool I know thing. you you and your husband volunteer even though you mm -hmm. are working mm -hmm. still so consequently right. it's yep. it's something you can do while continuing your career and and it's something that you can do as as an individual you can do that as a couple you can do that as a family our two boys joined in and and they help us also in different volunteer efforts my husband Pat and I really we firmly believe that that's an important piece. Well, what kind of skills do the volunteers need? Our volunteers serve in over 100 areas um, at Bryan, and we have skill sets for people that enjoy technology, um, escorting, transporting patients, providing information, directions, filing. We provide everything, but the most key piece is well, the customer service. On the screen right now is one of the specialized skills that actually some of your volunteers have. This is the harpist yes. that that entertains people or mm -hmm. motivates them, one of the two. <laughs> Margaret brings her harp in and provides music, and that music brings a lot of joy to all ages. Mm -hmm. See, we, we also have some pictures of volunteers that are in the older age group here. We do. That's Sharon and Tom Beechel, and um, Sharon volunteers in the surgery waiting room. Tom volunteers in admissions. Very positive people. This is Dot and Frances Haskins. Dot enjoys coming to the hospital, and currently her job is stuffing heart pillows for our cardiac patients. We make heart pillows, and Frances works at the Plaza Information Desk. There you go. So there's mm -hmm. all kinds of skill levels, and they're all and smiling at least. So. Yeah. <laughs> this is a group of, of, of our youth with one of our adult volunteers, Diane. Yeah. And the youth put together um, packets for Halloween to give out yes. and had a great time doing it. And that just shows that there are all, all age groups there. So uh, actually, the people who are 14 years in high school age obviously don't come with much skill. but. Actually, they do get exposure to skills and, and experiences they can use outside of just their volunteering. So it's a good experience for a resume <laughs> for the younger people. It's a great experience for, for a resume, for college entrance. 
um, a, a, a future job. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So how would someone who is interested in volunteering get started at this? Um, we would welcome a phone call at um, at our main office number, 402-481-3032, or you can click on the BrianHealth.com website. We have a volunteer page, and it's step-by-step, -step, how can you get involved? Well, actually, your exposure would go beyond just Brian also. For example, some people would want to uh, get do other skills, like you're working with children or working with the environment. And Mid Plains Volunteer Network, you mm -hmm. could refer them to that by yep. in their interview. And also you refer people who want to work with children, for example, to the Lincoln Public Schools. So consequently, yep. you can, if they call and talk to you and say, I'm really interested in environmental position or something, mm -hmm. you can kind of tell them where to go. And, we are, all of my staff are very talented, very skilled, and very knowledgeable. We're very happy to visit with people and try to, to find that, that perfect place for them. We also have a connection with Volunteer Partners, which is like a clearinghouse of all the volunteer oh, opportunities in Lincoln. Oh, We're see. happy to share that information. Oh, um, obviously, we want people at Bryan, yes. but we sure will help them find their niche. Yes, and, and there are a few positions they could work with children, but, there are. but they can't really work with environmental, for example. That's where a lot of younger people yeah. want to volunteer. So you could say, well, you can go to these exchanges and things like yep. that. Mm -hmm. So when people come to volunteer, what really are they usually looking for? Are they looking for more skills or are they just interested in serving people or what, what I don't would think be their that you motivation? can pinpoint one great motivation. I believe that there are people that have that inner desire to give of themselves. I believe there are people that are looking to build a resume. I believe that there are students that feel it's a great a great way to it's, look at colleges. There you go. Um, the other it, thing is it's a great way to meet friends. That's, yeah. That is one thing that I have noted that you told me about was the fact that the longevity of the volunteers is pretty long mm -hmm. and it's because of the friendships that they develop. It just keeps them coming back to visit with their friends. And it does. So there's does. a lot of longevity in the volunteering activity. So. And the, the other thing that I do find as I visit with volunteers, there is a sense of pride in being part of a, a really great team and being there to provide help and service and care. Well, our, our community should appreciate the volunteers because actually the volunteers keep the costs down for mm -hmm. many enterprises that would otherwise have to hire people to do those positions. So they're benefiting themselves with experience, but they're also benefiting the enterprises that they work with, particularly Brian, for yes, example. Yes, they are. They're helping us. They enhance the care that is there. Well, they add all sorts of good things. If, if I were a harpist, I don't know where else I would go <laughs> except to Brian, for example. So consequently, <laughs> in some cases where there's a special skill, you might really be able to yep. keep, their, keep their activity alive. We're always happy to visit with people and we're open to possibilities. I would like to thank our guest, Alan Beans, the Director of Volunteer and Customer Care at the Bryan Medical Center for volunteering to come on the show today and tell us about volunteering opportunities and benefits. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn or to volunteer. <laughs>